Welcome back to the show. We're about to learn the secret sauce. Theo, I, I am. I've been a, a fan of your sort of come up in the depth space, Y Combinator. Like you've done a lot in the last six months, maybe. Um, so like, hopefully we cover it all. Is it six months since like? It's been a bit longer than that. You got to me really early. It was in like January, if I recall. Like, yeah, super super early. So yeah. So um, I had saw you actually before we talk about that. Could you intro like what? Who are you? Howdy. I am Theo. I am a content creator and ex-Twitch engineer and the CEO of Ping.gg. We're building tools to make it easier for content creators to do collaborative video. So bring a guest onto your stream, content like this, whatever it takes to make it easy to do well-produced professional shows with guests. I used to work at Twitch. I was a software engineer, did everything from video infra to like safety tooling to a lot of front end. And now I'm, I guess, mostly known as a front end React TypeScript like engineer. I'm, I like to think of myself as more full stack. The big things I push for are full stack type safety and solutions that let you build really safe applications as fast as possible with teams of any size. Yeah. Yeah. So going back to, I, I discovered you from Twitter spaces. Like a lot of folks have probably discovered ping and other places. Um, yeah, it was like this, it was like web dev Wednesday. Um, you'd showed up on Jacob stream, like consistently I would see you around and like we started doing Twitter spaces for GitHub. So my former employer and uh, you joined, I don't know if we in, we invited you or maybe you joined once and then we invited you, uh, but you definitely showed up on one of the GitHub spaces as well. Uh, so you wanna talk about like that time and this, this, this sort of story? Yeah, of course. So I left Twitch because I wanted to focus more on creators and the roles I was finding within the company and the teams I was working on just did not focus enough on the creators and their direct needs. So I left and was working at another startup for a while. Things didn't go great, it wasn't the best fit for me. But I realized working there that I think I had it in me to do it myself. I wasn't quite sure. Started interviewing at a few other places and was really lucky to get some mentorship from Jake, the CEO of Railway.app. He was essential for me early on. He was recruiting me to work there. I had passed all the interviews. It was a really good fit. I was about to, actually, I think I did get an offer, but he knew that I was working on Ping on the side. It was a tiny little like video chat app for creators to bring guests in their show. And he knew that's where my heart was. And he kind of pushed me to do that. Eventually introduced me to one of his like best friends from childhood and high school, uh, Brendan Hawker, my co-founder and like head of product and design. Oh, amazing. And, uh, yeah, it's it was a very early say or sign for me that like talking to other like developers and people in the space, even if like you're not gonna be able to do exactly what they are looking for, just making those relationships and connections like clearly was bringing a lot of value to me. And I quickly tripled down on that. Yeah, well, triple down is like an understatement because like you legit, okay, you, you shipped your, uh, what's, called, what's called ping now. Yeah, uh, round by T3 tools. Yeah, so round by T3 tools, which I was very confused on what you were making. I didn't realize that was the focus of the product. I don't even know if that was your focus of the product when I found you uh, on Twitter, but here we are now. <laughs> and I think it's a great product. I, I use it for actually on this channel, uh, Chad and I do conversations on Twitter spaces. Chad is actually piped in through ping. Uh, so anybody who wants to know how that works, uh, Chad's based in Jamaica, has better quality video than I do. <laughs> and uh, it's because he's on ping. I absolutely love that. I'm so proud of like the infra and the things we're doing with WebRTC. You can get some really good video quality out of tech that people have thrown out as relevant for professional use cases for a while now. And yeah, I if Linus Tech Tips can get away with it now, if the biggest game shows on Twitch can get away with it, like uh, Austin Show was hosting Lover Host with us not too long ago. I like the professionals have discovered that what we're doing is ready for prime time use. And it's exciting to see the world realize WebRTC is as powerful as it is. Yeah, and it's been around forever. Like yep. I, I feel like I when I was learning how to code, WebRTC was like in the browser by that time. Uh, I think Google, it was pre Google Hangouts, but like, yeah, it's, it's a thing that's just sort of existed. And, uh, I, I'm curious, there's a, I guess Twitch is their platform built on WebRTC. Nope. They, I, I don't want to say hate, but actively avoid WebRTC at effectively all costs. It okay. was a thing that I, I was specifically discouraged from exploring at times. I saw use cases for it, but Twitch really wanted to focus on RTMP 
H.264 in distribution of that content as fast as possible, which they got it from 15 seconds of latency down to two, which is incredible. But we're talking two seconds of latency versus what we're getting at ping, which is regularly under 100 milliseconds from San Francisco to Japan, which yeah. is insane that with that level of distance, we can get 120th of the latency of the best case for Twitch. That is amazing. And this is a this is something that actually... so. <laughs> The, the last conversation with Chad, we actually went to this deep dive around competitive Street Fighter playing. And he was saying that like in Jamaica, it's hard to play with anybody outside of Jamaica because of the latency and how bad it is uh, because of on the island. And uh, so it's like a common problem with gaming. And it's amazing that your the latency is like a, it's a solved problem now with this with your service. For us, yes, there are different latency targets necessary for different types yeah. of things. Like a frame in a 60 FPS game is 16 milliseconds. So to have a frame perfect synchronized experience, yeah. you have to have less than 16 milliseconds of latency between clients. Every additional 16 from there is a frame between you and that game or other gamer that yeah. is lost. So if you have 100 milliseconds of latency, which is our target, that is still six frames that you are behind your like competitors games target under 20 whenever they can for that specific reason things like a shared music experience like if i was to play drums and you were to play guitar in rhythm with me yeah. that would need about 35 to 50 milliseconds like there's debate over what the target is there anything under 50 should be good enough for a good experience but that means you'd be in the same state as the person almost like guaranteed yeah. just the speed of light's going to be the bottleneck there yeah yeah that that's that is a challenge i actually i had an idea for an app where it was synchronized like music playing impossible yes i know Actually this impossible. now i know i know this very clearly now uh after just learning just about this normal web programming and network uh and delays and stuff like that but um also ping is a great name <laughs> thank you i am we as a company are about 85 percent sure britain came up with it we've forgotten because yeah. it was like a collaborative process where we, just, we need a new name and we just sat and thought for a while and landed on ping and then we got a hold of ping.gg which was nuts too so yeah yeah, and GG is like the the sort of uh, quick yeah. sign. We off. already were T3.GG, so yeah. that was like it was the perfect like transition. And I also got to take the T3 brand back for myself because I had kind of given that to the company at the time because we were around by T3 Tools and we were paying by T3 Tools. Then we became paying Labs, and we just go by paying GG usually now. Yeah, yeah. And um, what's T3? What's the origin? T3. Be? It's my name. T H E O. <laughs> Three letters after. Oh, okay. Yep. We joke now that it's Tailwind TypeScript and TRPC because the T3 stack has caught yes. on, but it is Theo. We also, uh, we got so close to doing a podcast with uh, Tyler from, uh, I always forget the name of UI.dev and Tanner Lindsley, the creator of React Query and the TAN stack, because yeah. we're all teased we're going to do the T3 podcast. Excellent. <laughs> but we just, we're always all way too busy. Yes. Yeah. Tanner does a ton of stuff so much I, yeah. I do not know how he manages to do all of the things he does yeah it's scaling i guess i don't know but tanner you I, you owe me a dm <laughs> just, just to throw that out there shout out tanner i oh i owe him way more than a dm uh if we want to go back to my origin story a bit i yeah. owe him in particular immensely like he was my intro to not just really twitter spaces but like participating in twitter like conversations really? as a whole i like had had a few back and forth with Fred from uh, Astro and with Ryan from Sala, just like convos in the DMs about like copy editing for their blog posts and such. Yeah. But the first time I got really deep on a technical conversation was chatting with Tanner. I joined one of his spaces because I had this terrible proposal I had written up of a custom React hook that was a compiler hook that you would write backend code. It was called use backend. So you write some backend code, do your Prisma call, whatever, in your React component. And then at compile time, it would rip that out, make it a backend like API, and then put React query in there to just call that backend thing. Okay, yeah, that sounds complicated. It wouldn't have been too bad to do. And there are people who are doing things very similar now. It's definitely like a pattern that I've seen others trying. Funny enough, Solid Start and the Solid JS guys are doing something very similar with their server primitives. I showed this proposal to Tanner. I was like, what are your thoughts? He said, this sounds crazy. I love it. There are two projects that do something kind of similar. One is named Blitz.js and the other is named TRPC. They both use React Query, I think. I haven't had a chance to look into them at all. Down to do that, come back to my next space and we can chat about it. And that was like my first time I have to go do a technical deep dive and then like come back and have a conversation with an audience about it. Yeah. And kind of got hooked from there. So yeah. huge shout out to Tanner specifically for giving me the, the homework I needed to take this all more seriously. Yeah, yeah. and uh, you, I think... I keep saying this, but you introduced me to TRPC. We haven't actually implemented it into anything that we're working on yet, 
but I didn't even know it was, I wasn't aware of it and until that conversation. Get on that. It will take an hour to set up if you do it like vanilla yourself and it will immediately start saving you time and fixing bugs like instantaneously. Yeah. I, I'm a I'm big type. I, I'm a TypeScript con recent convert to TypeScript, which I've avoided it mainly because everything I do is side projects. Also, most TypeScript I interact with is libraries that already have TypeScript built in. So I was like, oh, I know types. I'll just work with other libraries that have it, but I'll never reach for it. And then once we started leveraging it inside of all the open source code base, it was like, oh, I get it. I get why <laughs> this is a valuable solution, uh, at least in the JavaScript ecosystem. I competitively program a bit. It's not like my biggest thing at all anymore, but every year I go out of my way to do the advent of code challenge. It's yeah. a programming challenge where every day at 9 PM PT, it's midnight EST, a new problem comes out that has two parts. After the first part is completed and you submit an answer, the second part becomes revealed to you. And depending on how good you solve the first one, the second one will either be really he easy or you're rewriting everything from scratch and like, yeah. miserable. I, I love that uh, programming challenge. It's by far my favorite. I don't like the hacker rank type stuff normally, but I love advent of code. I've been doing it full TypeScript, full type safe, not a single any for three years now. And I regularly am able to break top 100. Really? Wow. You move faster when you let type safety carry you. You can stop using that huge part of your brain that is double and triple checking everything you do and trust the compiler to do it for you. You have to, to submit to the rules. You have to do what TypeScript says. But as soon as you are working with like full strict TypeScript from, especially when you can use something like TRBC to go all the way from the back into the front end, there is a whole cat, like, like a dimension of problems you normally run into that you've eradicated by doing that. Wow. Yeah. I believe it too as well. Cause I've, I've done, I've done rust. Uh, I've done go, uh, with like some types also built in there and it is definitely a pretty nice experience when you can sort of fall back. On... Neither of those languages have good inference is the big problem. The yes. big strength of TypeScript is when used right, you're not writing much TypeScript. Yeah. And that's the beauty of TRPC. It's, it's TypeScript by name, not by like, your dx necessarily like yeah when you do something wrong then it becomes typescript and it tells you but all of the trpc files in my code base like my trpc router and the trpc like a query like mutation like piles of functions that i write none of them have a single type definition in them because you don't need to write typescript to benefit from typescript if your system infers from value to user yeah yeah th this is true and i i do love taking types from other libraries and also when they're already established so I actually, sorry, I'm not going to even finish that thought because I wanted, to, I want to go back to this conversation around your introduction to Twitter, where I found you, yeah. uh, cause like you, you kind of like had a whole blow up, <laughs> like not blow up is the wrong word. The, the, You've had a come up. Yeah. It's been chaotic. It's been a little bursty, but this last burst has been going for a while now. Yeah. So, and what, what do you attribute to that? Persistence, honestly, yeah. it's just being around enough. Nobody clicks the follow the first time you have a good tweet. They click the follow when this is the twentieth good tweet of yours they've seen. They're like, "Oh, fine, I'll follow this guy now." Yeah, and I, I see that. Like, this, I've been on these things for a while. There's a lot of people in the dev space I follow and watch the content of. And every once in a while, somebody that I've been a fan of forever just follows me back. It's like I know you've seen my tweets. You've replied to some of them. Yeah. Now is the moment you're following me back. Like eight plus months since we started interacting sure but it, it is that persistence that i think is huge there yeah is it that um so you weren't on twitter but you leveraged twitch and you had the sort of attraction to work on the creator problem which wasn't barely being focused like did you learn tips as like the creator sort of the creator ecosystem that you're applying now i wouldn't say i learned much about twitter from there i would say like the thing that i've realized over time is like i've really crystallize the idea of the creator funnel and how creators like bring viewers to their content. There are platforms that focus more on like the number of people you engage with for short engagement. So when I'm on Twitter and I scroll through my feed for five minutes, I might see hundreds of different people's tweets. When I'm on TikTok and I scroll through my feed for 10 minutes, I might see like a dozen to four dozen people's TikToks. When I go on YouTube, I scroll, there's a bunch of thumbnails, but I only watch one or two videos. When you go to Twitch, you go to one person's URL on Twitch and you stay there till they're offline you might raid to somebody else for a little bit and then you bounce. Yeah. So on the top of this funnel are platforms that ha have that level of like number of people you en encounter in a session and that type of like distribution. Those platforms tend to be the best place to find your audience. And then the bottom of the funnel is things like Twitch, Patreon, OnlyFans, where nobody's going to OnlyFans to find their next favorite person. Nobody's going to Twitch to find their next favorite streamer. They're going there to follow the person that they met at the top of the funnel down to that place. Yeah. That's where you convert viewers into like 
more like dedicated community members into spenders for buying merch, like subscribing yeah. to your channel, stuff like that. Twitter's how you engage, like discover that audience. YouTube's this really interesting middle ground where the algorithm exists. You can be discovered to an extent on YouTube, but it is a much harder fight to get your stuff in the feed. Yeah. Like the, the things that have blown me up the most on Twitter are like one sentence shit posts about Tailwind. <laughs> and the thing that's blown me up on YouTube is going ham on a video, having my editor like tidy up the hell out of it, sitting there for hours, getting my thumbnail and title just right, uploading it, watching obsessively for the first two hours, seeing that the click through is not as good as I would like it, adjusting the thumbnail and the title for those like two hours from midnight to two in the morning going to bed and waking up to see if it went viral or not. And that's yeah. that effort doesn't work on the top and it doesn't do anything on the bottom. Yeah. So Twitter's like low effort, high discovery. YouTube is insanely high effort, medium discovery, decent conversion. And then Twitch is the bottom. The only reason Twitch really makes sense for me now is I use it for my content creation. It's the yeah. easiest way to just go live, talk shit, make clips, send it to my editor, get it live on my YouTube video or on yeah. my YouTube channel. But Beyond that, Twitch is just a thing I, I care a lot about. I think live creation is an incredible thing in the community yeah. and relations you can build with it. YouTube is the place to succeed as a creator. Twitter's the place to get discovered. Yeah. Yeah, this is something that I, I put a lot of thought into because I DevRel is what I did at GitHub. And we we had a YouTube channel uh, at GitHub that was unmaintained. Does it say GitHub had a YouTube channel? Yeah, <laughs> it, it was unmaintained. It was basically what I called the conference graveyard. So GitHub Universe uploaded there. Every now and there was like a marketing video that went viral that uploaded there. And then everything in between was just like random stuff. And uh, so the DevRel team at GitHub back in 2020, we took over. We basically said, hey, we're not traveling. We're going to start shipping YouTube because there's some value here. We had like 100,000, I think, subscribers at that point today. It's like 220. So not super viral growth, but like we do get way more views on content. And it was mainly the, the thumbnail, the title. Uh, once we started doing thumbnails and titles on a, pl on a subscriber base that actually like it was a huge number that watched first day notifications. Uh, it made a huge difference. And uh, I saw that and that's what I'm trying to apply to the open source channel. Like uh, we haven't got this sort of virality that you, you've seen on, over on them. Um, actually, I didn't know if it's like Theo Ping, I don't know whatever your it's name is. Ping. It, Theo Ping. I just put the company name in there because yeah. like, I want to feel like I'm doing something for the company when I'm going viral on yeah, YouTube. We, yeah, and when you're on uh, Twitch for like uh, four hours in the, in the afternoon on Wednesday, um, you're convert, which I honestly, I think that that sort of funnel, like with ping, it makes so much sense for you to be online, showing your product once a week, having conversation with devs that you probably could hire or convince to use the product, uh, and their, their, whatever way they're going to be doing it. Uh, I, I, I'm just going to say right now, that's genius. I, I it, it'll be incredibly useful in a year right now. It's a lot harder to justify oh, it, yeah. like the, the conversion off of it is awful. It's like our, our product is very focused. Yeah. I like if I shill to a thousand people when I'm streaming, what ping is exactly what it does go like really in depth, like 20 plus people in chat will be like, oh my God, this looks great. This makes so much sense. Not for me though. I'm not a streamer. <laughs> Streamers don't yeah. watch streams. And that's a really important thing to know. That I, actually, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. You're, you're, you're burnt on yours. You might watch YouTube videos and those convert. Okay. And my, like, I, I will never for the rest of my life have to worry about finding a good engineer to hire, which is in a yes. wonderful thing. Like there are so many people I wish I could be hiring right now and I can't. There was like memes in the community about how like, as soon as Theo has one opening, it's the Hunger Games out here. <laughs> but like, I, yeah, I just, I, I love the opportunity I have right now. If I was building developer tools, I'd be a very, very wealthy and successful person right now. Yeah. But I want to solve creator problems. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. And I, I totally get that too, because, um, I also stream um, actually twice a week, pretty consistently, uh, bring way lower numbers. But I also realize I stream on Wednesday the same time you're streaming. Like automatically, I just I jump over to your stream and I'm like, oh, let me just catch whatever Theo is talking about because I think like you you bring. So for context, we're talking about Web Dev Wednesday. Is what I guess what the, the name is. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'm keeping it or not. It was okay. just like a funny thing I came up with on Twitter forever ago. Well, it's stuck. It, it, it's still sticking. And uh, so I'm like, oh, cool. Theo's going to talk about something that's interesting and I don't have to listen to another podcast because he's just going to digest it right here and I'll just have it on while I'm cleaning up emails and stuff like that. And it's actually super insightful stuff. Um, honestly, in the beginning, it was like, it felt like way more hot takes because like there would always be like something be like, oh yeah, um, man, I remember what the most recent one was, but um Actually, you remember like any sort of recent hot takes that sort of blew up recently? Uh, Tailwind's the new Flexbox. <laughs> yes. Oh, that, actually, I did see that tweet. That was actually a pretty, 
pretty good tweet. Um, but yeah, so that hot take, and I think Tailwinds is, is it's a it is a good tool to have hot takes around because I think it does good what it does. But also, everyone remembers Bootstrap. Everyone remembers like when everyone got stuck. Oh boy, fighting words. Okay, <laughs> uh, yeah, it is not Bootstrap, and this is why I fight so much about Tailwind. Yes, Tailwind is closer to TypeScript than it is to Bootstrap. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Tailwind is an extension of CSS to make it easier to write CSS fast. If anything, it's closer to CoffeeScript than anything. Yeah. Bootstrap is closer to like Angular. It is a okay. prescribed way to do everything with UI and opinions about it. Tailwind is this the is first true. thing that made me faster at writing CSS. Bootstrap prevents you from writing the CSS, which is the big failure uh, there. Okay, got it. Yeah. Tailwind is Zen mode CSS, and that's why I love it. I didn't like writing CSS before Tailwind. It made me like it more. And my yeah. designer loves it too. That That is insane. To have an engineer who doesn't like CSS and a designer who loves CSS agree on a solution means you actually struck gold. This is a different thing from all the other UI frameworks. I used to never care. Another engineer brought Tailwind because different engineers always bring different UI libraries. Yeah. I never cared about one enough to like have an opinion. Tailwind is why I now have an opinion. And I have a strong opinion. If you're not using it, you need a good reason. Yeah, yeah. So uh, for the record, we are using Tailwind. And we actually, we actually have a very similar situation where the designer actually enjoys Tailwind, didn't really have an opinion going in, but once we started using it for our design system, we don't have to worry about CSS because it goes from Figma to components pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And uh, I also don't want to do any CSS. So I'm also pretty much hands off, don't care. Um, but also good pushback on the Bootstrap thing because I think Tailwind and Bootstrap get conflated. I also remember CoffeeScript. And I remember the migration they did for the company I worked on when ES6 was finally ready for prime time. And it was a great experience writing a bunch of ES6 because I learned it really quickly out of CoffeeScript. But also I realized I didn't know how to write JavaScript because of CoffeeScript. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it, we're, we'll eventually get to, we'll probably get to a place where we're like, oh, you know what? CSS has evolved enough that everybody migrates back. And I think that's a, an okay problem to have. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Tailwind makes inline styles pleasant and maintainable. Yeah. And that is an incredibly large value that CSS doesn't deliver due to the way things have changed since it was invented. And I, I really think it is more like TypeScript than anything. It, it's like an in-between of TypeScript and like uh, CoffeeScript. The, the magic that makes it so valuable that I, I guess value is the wrong word. The, the magic that keeps my like do it the web way brain from getting angry is when you hover over one of the tailwind classes in your editor, it just tells you the one line of CSS it adds. There are like, like four ish tailwind like class types that have more than one line of CSS. Most of them literally apply one thing and it is a, a faster way to apply those things. And when you pull it up with a cheat sheet next to you, it does make you better at CSS. CoffeeScript teaches you patterns, but it doesn't necessarily teach you CSS. The thing that really is telling for me about Tailwind is on projects where I don't use it, I'm in the Tailwind docs more because I'm ripping the CSS from it because I know what it does. I, I trust it like immensely. So yeah. I'm in the docs more when I'm not using Tailwind. Yeah, yeah, and that's just so we we danced around this a bit, and you mentioned a couple of times the the T three app repo, uh, and I want to talk about that open source project too as well. Um, I, I know a bit of the history of it, but do you want to talk about like create T three app because uh, like all these sort of like I don't know primitives decisions that are already decided, like they exist in this this framework. Yeah, so. I actually think this will be a good way to like bookend the history of Theo thing. So before I was really on Twitter at all, I had started streaming again because I, I missed it. I did it a bit when I was working at Twitch and I did it a lot more before then and wanted to do more like engineer type stuff. I had three-ish streams and I saved the videos for two of them. The first one, I just, I wasn't prepared. So the VOD is dead and gone forever. But the second one was I built an app from scratch using the stack that I use at Ping. So uh, planet scale for the database, Prisma for the database, like connection layer, Tailwind for all things UI, TypeScript for everything, Next.js for like the web framework with React, of course, within it, and TRPC for the binding between the back end and the front end. And I was able to build a whole app. It was a roundest it's you vote for which pokemon is rounder so i i wanted a code name to replace round by t3 tools internally okay <laughs> and i figured let the community decide what the roundest pokemon is for me <laughs> and i built it in like an hour and a half because the stack let me move that fast nice. the vod sat on my youtube nobody looked at it i out of nowhere got dan abramoff to come on my show to do a mock job interview uh, i remember that actually yeah. yeah that was the second thing i did still like barely existed on twitter when that happened then I got into Y Combinator. So I did a few more streams, 
kind of edited them, had uh, one of my good friends uh, who now works at Paying Adam edit a few for me, but he wasn't like, he doesn't know the tech space enough to know like what to cut and what to add and like how to really like do the chaotic code stream that I was doing like into shorter videos. So the cut channels kind of sat around. It wasn't the focus, especially during like the three months at Y Combinator, March in particular, when I was fundraising, just nothing happened for me in the creator world. Looking at my analytics now, it's so funny, especially on Twitter where it's just like, this month I got four followers. <laughs> And then the next month I got like 6,000. Wow. <laughs> and it was because like that I was on the grind. I was doing the Y Combinator stuff. And I think I just more than anything needed a break, but also knew I needed to understand the customers better and take like the video world more seriously if I was going to build these really complicated things for them. And I knew the things that weren't working and I wanted to address them for myself. So I went out of my way to think like the thumbnail thing's the big one. I just sit there for hours, like tidying up a thumbnail until I see it taken the algorithm and when I would edit my own videos, which funny, like when I hired my editor to work at Ping, I basically fired him from my channel. So yeah. I had to edit my own videos and that ended up helping a ton because I realized how hard it was to edit my videos because I streamed in such a chaotic matter. And when I realized that and I wanted to make it easier to edit, I started streaming differently because I was thinking about the edit after. And I became not only like, not only did the content become easier to edit, I think it became better too. Because yeah. I was much more focused on topics. I would get through an idea like cohesively. I would ask chat for feedback and like, did this make sense? Do you guys understand? It was like having a person in the room while you're recording a YouTube video, but there's hundreds of them and they won't let you slip up. It's the best. Yeah. And that all kept going. But that one old video, the crappy, poorly edited, my hair was still like this long <laughs> from November. I think it was actually like September, October where I built this like app on the side from scratch. It still has the exact same thumbnail I made that I've been too scared to change it because I don't think yeah. I have the original file anymore. That's now at 150,000 plays on YouTube. Wow. That is, other than the Dan Abram interview, by far the best performing video on my channel. And the stack I used from there has gotten a lot of attention. It's the same stack I use at Ping. The important detail is how modular it is. Like Each of these pieces is a piece that I swapped to because I was using other things in the past. Yeah. And these are the ones that I, I feel the strongest about that they will help you build fast, scale well, maintain type safety without having too much buy-in on any one part. Like any piece in the stack can be swapped. And that's really important to me. People kept asking for a boilerplate repo, like a template that had all of the technology included within it. And I kept pushing back saying, no, I am not building that because you don't need to install next auth on your blog. And I know that's what's going to happen. If I include all of this technology in a template, people are going to use it for things it's not for. Maybe someday if I have time, I'll make a CLI that lets you pick the technology. Yeah, like extension or something. Yeah. But that's a lot of work. I think it's going to be really challenging. But hey, if anybody in the community wants to build it, you have my blessing, go do it. And this kid from India, Nexel, I think he was 16 at the time, took the challenge and built the repo and started using it for other projects. And I saw a blog post going viral that was like clearly a clone of one of my YouTube videos. And I reached out to him. He had forgotten, it, it wasn't he forgot to credit me, it's he felt bad like annoying me and like pushing back to me constantly as this like new kid. But we've been chatting a ton since. I was actually like giving him like uh, copy edits and like feedback on a blog post on the Uber here. He is absolutely killing it. Uh, one of like the most inspiring like younger devs I've ever met. Wow. He made create t3 app it was great quickly moved into maintainer mode because of how many people were contributing there's now 56 contributors in this project people doing everything from like obviously like documentation and like readme changes but that's like less than a fourth of them it's like actual code changes because my whole community uses the stack on their side projects they run into problems they use the init and like it doesn't do something they need it to or they have a solution they use they're made up in their own project that they want to recommend for our template and Quickly, a few people stood up and like have become the, the lead maintainers with like Julius and Excel tending to lead things uh, and White like hopping in all the time as well. And the only contribution I've made is like the readme. Yeah. <laughs> Everything else is them. They watch my content. They see what I'm doing. They ask me questions. They pull me in for the conversation and they built the best way to start a new full stack application. Yeah. And it was from your video. So you didn't actually write the code. I didn't write a thing. Yeah. There, there was no code in there of mine. That is amazing. Yeah. They, they kicked so much ass and I'm, I'm genuinely so proud of the community. They just broke 5k stars on GitHub. Yeah. There's over 50 contributors on a repo. That's like three months old, which is insane. Like that, that in particular is so insane. Over half of them are first time contributors yes. and all the contributions have been incredible. It's 
been such an awesome project in that way. And there will be companies that start on Create T3 app that are very successful someday. It is the best way to get started on a new project. And I I use it for everything I built that is an app, to be clear. Astro is great for static stuff, but T3 app for everything else. That, that's amazing. Yeah. It's, uh, so the the maintainer in India, are they're not working for Ping or anything like that. They're no, just... he's just a kid in college. Or, or, uh, he's finishing up high school, I think, right now. Finishing up high school. All yeah. right. Well, hit me up if you want a job. <laughs> no, just, just kidding. Yeah, there are so many crazy people in that community. I, I'm waiting for recruiters to notice that my Discord is like a hot place to be because there are like 4,000 people that are largely in the community because they're not getting the types of like mentorship or yeah. like buy-in that they were looking for at work. So they come more than anything to my community to vent. That's kind yeah. of why I made it. I lost my 300 plus person front end channel at Slack that I would shit post in. So I started doing it on YouTube and Twitch and eventually Twitter to make up for what I was missing there. And what I learned is there's a lot of people who don't have that or never had it. And yeah. my community is like the place to go. Uh, yeah, I love it. And I love these like um, communities because, um, well, your community is kind of centralized around Twitch a bit or maybe all the content you've done. I've got a community which is open source, but there's also some other like dev creators um, which I know, um, Jacob has, what's the name of the community? It's, um, the rail, the, um, uh, railway or no, no, the, um, rail, rate, rate. Oh, guild. uh, OSRG. Yes. <laughs> yeah, Open yes. Source rate guild. Yeah. Yeah. So like, it's a small community, but I've actually met people from there as well. And we've had like really, really good conversations about like decisions, but also I was able to mentor at least one person getting a job, uh, as well out of that community. And I love that there's like places for people to find this because I think what, was missing for years is like there is folks like I was just talking to Jordan Harbon who does a lot of open source con contribution. Like he lives here in the Bay, grew up here in the Bay, knows a lot of people, but there's like people in India, there's people in like Kansas city that need to have that interaction, that connection to know what the next thing is. And like, if you have the, the T3 app framework or just like the, the, I guess it's a template repo. It's a framework. It's a CLI. It's, uh, it's a CLI. It's a yeah. project initialization CLI. Yeah. Yeah, so that like gets you a good head start to be able to say, you know what, I don't need to make all these decisions. I just want to put something on a page, uh, which you also entered me to, um, man, I'm, I'm blanking to the guy, the nonprofit. Oh, uh, J or Jason Docton. Yeah, Jason, who taught himself next. Like that, having a framework to be able to learn web is, it, it's mind blowing that this is like, you don't need to know, you know, every single in and out of how networking works just to get a site on deployed to Vercel. It's just, no, that's like now it or upload it through GitHub. We're definitely trying to like walk a, a line here. And it's been tough in a lot of ways because like there's a lot of additional things we could provide that most people need, but there's a lot that we could provide that most don't. Yeah. And every time there's a proposal, like we should add protected routes. So an example of having a route that you can only go to if you're off and it redirects otherwise. We don't use those on ping. If you're not off, it keeps you on that route. It renders a signing component and then keeps you back there after. Like it's... Yeah. This is a, a flow that depends on what you specifically need. And I want to make sure every developer has the agency to make those decisions. And any decisions we made, we made because they are important for everybody using these things. And we comment the hell out of them accordingly. Like one of the like spicier ones we did that is the source of a lot of the, like the issues we get and like people coming in for support is we have a fully type safe environment variable system built in that validates your environment variables at like build time which means the first time you initialize a project with all the checkboxes on, it fails to build. Okay. We did that intentionally because you need to choose what database you're connecting to and what next auth credentials you're using because that's a, that's a decision you need to make. We're not going to make it for you. We're not going to give you a dumb example. We used to just have like a SQLite DB you would write to by default, but people didn't know how to change or even where to go. It, so it's now very we, problematic in previous like frameworks where SQLite was like, oh, I didn't know I couldn't just use this in production. Yep. So now we force you to think about it because those are decisions you have to make and they're not ones that it even makes sense for us to prescribe solutions to. However, environment variables, absolutely we should prescribe a solution to because now we're, by doing that, we're forcing you to confront those other decisions you might have avoided. Yeah, that's actually a really good way. To, you mentioned so many first time contributors because if I don't know anything about this and as I'm trying to deploy this thing or, or run it for the first time, if I'm forced to make that decision, then I know to ask that question. Yep. And then I think then the funnel is like, you get to the discord, like, oh, there's people here. Maybe I can ask other questions. And then people eventually just hang out. That's exactly how it's happened. It has been super consistent having people like run into an issue and then become active contributors. Like people who joined originally as like front end devs, or maybe back end devs wanting to do front end, or maybe just hobbyists that want to start programming more seriously. Like 
it works for all of them if you're down to sit there and like feel dumb for a bit because create t3 app was not built to make you feel smart it's built to let you be dumb and i think that that's like the best part of it yeah that's that's amazing too as well you know there's a softer side to the hot takes here people (laughs) i i think that that's been coming out more it's been nice because there's there's a lot of people in the community who still don't know how to or if they should engage with me due to the the spice level being above average but i think that people are starting to know it like the big one for me is Tanner. If Tanner Lindsley ever feels like I've gone too far, I need to walk things back because he is he's like a teddy bear of a human. He is the best. And for us to agree as often as we do and for us, I, I almost feel like we're like opposite sides of the same coin in that way where we're both fighting for the same thing, which is make the web better and yeah. like specifically web applications we both do a lot of. So not how do you make your blog like five milliseconds faster rather how do you build a massive application the size of twitch the size of ping the size of all of the crazy things that he's working on in the seo world like how do we build things that scale to those sizes in the browser yeah yeah i mean that's at at the end of the day everyone wants to work on that that problem and i think everyone has a different flavor and a different like approach to it and i what i love about things like uh open source and like finding things randomly on github or random youtube videos because i'm also I run into a lot of devs on, on YouTube now because I pay attention. So like these are ideas I don't have to do a lot of searching for because I stumble into them. And I, th- I like the fact that people can stumble into like your content around breaking down like GraphQL or breaking down why TRPC is like the flavor that you should definitely be tasting right now. And uh, yeah, so I appreciate all the all the work that and, and the content you put out. Uh, my question though is like all the stuff that you do on the dev side and like even, so I didn't know you didn't write any code in T3 uh, app. I just knew that you were like, you were the hype beast for that project. Uh, and I think that's, me. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's awesome that that exists too as well from that video. Cause now these folks, these are like people winning and maintaining a project, maybe the first time, maybe the second time, but there's people now contributing to this project. Some of the, whoever creates the next big framework, like the thing that, that kills next J or that kills like react and next will have come from my community. I'm 100% confident in that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So what's your, what's your take on things like solid? I love solid. I'm really close with Ryan. I've been using solid a bunch more on side projects. I did a, a rant about it on stream yesterday because I'm building a new chat app with it. It's super promising. I, it, it, it breaks your react brain in exactly the right ways to help break people out of react brain, I think. And it's yeah. really exciting in that sense. Also the performance is nuts. Ryan's a phenomenal maintainer. He's starting to build up his own little community too. I think he has discovered the power of content as well. He was yeah. to an extent, what I was trying to do early on was take the stuff he was doing on like StreamYard on his laptop to like 10 viewers that were like hardcore nerds like me. I was trying to take those awesome lessons and bring them to like a slightly wider audience. That's like in a way that's a little easier to approach like a more digestible th- version. He's leveled up his game a ton and he's pulling like appropriate views now for that. And it's wow. really cool to see he's now co-streaming on Twitch as well. But I have always looked up to him and his knowledge and the stuff he's building is incredible. There's a lot of overlap between like that community and our community. We're sharing maintainers of stuff all the time. And I think that his like core maintainers for his little solid crew, a lot of them came from the content world as well. Like people that he found on his Twitch chat and YouTube chat and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually, I'm looking forward to chatting with Ryan actually in a couple of weeks uh, right here as well. He's he's a person that I've known of uh, and I've known of solid for a bit, but I've just haven't paid attention that closely. So and he I was, feel like I have to pay attention now. He was one of the first people like that I started chatting with in the dev space. I remember when I saw the post on HN that's like new framework faster than Svelte, but uses JSX. Yeah. And I was like, wait, the only thing I didn't like about Svelte is that it is forcing me to learn a new language. If I could have something that's similar, but still can use JavaScript and JSX in particular, that sounds very intriguing. So I've kept an eye on Solid since that like first post, maybe four years ago now. And I've been like somewhat friendly with Ryan since I was like, it, he was like a 3000 follower account. So it was really scary DMing him as a 50 follower account at the time. But oh, really? Wow. He's been a homie since I, I love the, that whole crew. I want to touch a bit more on like specifically the maintainers he has and the people yeah. that are working on create T3 app. Cause there's this like specific type of person that there isn't a good word for. And I've been getting into more, I want to say arguments, but like, passionate like conversations with other people in the space uh dan Jatanium and i had a really good talk about this yesterday where there are people that many would refer to as beginners and they might even refer to themselves as beginners that 
to an extent have too high a bar for themselves. Like people who taught themselves to code have been doing it on the side for like two plus years now that can have a very deep technical conversation. Maybe they haven't had their first job yet, or maybe they're a 17 year old kid in high school. They have enough experience to have deep technical conversations with me about crazy shit. And then I'm like, oh, cool. Where are you working? Like, how are you using stuff? It's like, oh, I am still in school. I'm a little scared to get my job or I still am working as a ramen chef. One of the engineers at Peng started doing that and that like poached them off there. And now they're one of the best engineers at the company. Like wow, this category of people who are beginner exclusively in career, but they might not have like the necessary things to be at like a phenomenal, like first time hire that's going to like lead a big project. Like they're not senior in that sense, but they're very deep technically and very passionate. Like they have this drive that pushes them quickly out of the traditional beginner stage. Yeah. And there really isn't a place for them to land right now. Yeah. That's just missing. Like if you learn to code because your friends are doing it and in two weeks you're the best coder in the group, where are you two months from then? Like, where, where do you go? You're like a kid in school or you're working a different job. Like, what do you do with that skill and that seniority? And I think that my community is one of the few places you can land because before it, all the other communities like on YouTube and stuff were how to write your first React app. And yes. that's not what they're looking for. There, there's a lot of very, very extremely beginner friendly spaces. And I think this sort of like be in between of like, I don't have the experience. And I, I actually think of the person who I mentored from the, the, the rail guild as well fits in that, that, that sort of uh, situation where it's like, almost like, I guess what I'm thinking about, I just watched, um, it was, a. <laughs> I don't know why I'm blanking on names, but anyway, there's the NBA player who played for the Lakers, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Uh, he was just like so tall that he could not play for the JV team. He had to go play the varsity like immediately. And I think it's like kind of, it's maybe I'm forcing yeah. the uh, analogy, but it's almost similar where someone's is like, they're definitely a varsity player, but they just showed up in school. So like no one knows until like they get on the court and they're like, you're not supposed to be here. You should be... <laughs> with those guys. Yep. And uh, I think it's it's probably similar with, with your your crew, especially if you're early in your career and you're already touching TypeScript, you're already like shipping production. You're maintaining an open source application with 5,000 stars on GitHub and thousands of projects starting on it every day. Yeah. Yeah, and it's-, it's <laughs> That's not a junior dev, that's not a beginner anymore. Yeah, there, there's a few people who I've seen also come up like that, like two tra traditional pathways, maybe they just happen to like start early. But yeah, that's actually, that's amazing too as well. And like, thanks for the, the tip on the uh, the Discord, hiring people from there. Yeah, there's a lot of awesome people that are looking for cool opportunities, especially like open source and dev tool world. Like that's what they're all there for. And it's it's really cool having a place for them to land because I, I was lucky. I went to a, a university where there's a bunch of programmers and even though I didn't take it very seriously, then I like was able to help run the open source, uh, like program at my school, the Rensselaer Center for Open Source, Arcos. I got to like contribute to a bunch of stuff. I had a Chrome extension I built back then, Chrome Tana, that went super viral. It's, it's, I think it was like a million plus installer, or installs still, which is crazy. It was just to redirect Bing searches to Google when you're on Windows 10 with the little Cortana search thing. I had the like fortunate opportunity to, to always have other devs to talk to. And as soon as I was out of college, I landed at Twitch and was immediately under like one of the best engineers I ever worked with and historically had like people I could have like hard conversations about engineering stuff with, be wrong, get owned and learn a whole bunch from yeah. it. And that was so valuable for me getting good fast. And you can't have that if you don't have those communities and you don't have those jobs. Like a bunch of the people in my community, they don't know other devs. They don't have developer friends in the real world. They're the only dev they know in person. And my community is a place to like talk about programming for the first time. The problem that comes with that is the people you see are inherently the ones who are the most successful because those are the ones, those are the like people who are yeah, getting the, the most. They digitally. shine the most, yeah. Exactly. And when you don't have friends around you to compare yourself against, you don't have peers to use as your like baseline for what is progress as a dev. And all you see is these wizards like, creating these huge open source frameworks or making tailwind or all like, like Jason Dalton's not a good bar to set for yourself. Like he is yeah. inhuman how good he got. But when you only have those things to compare yourself against, it's really hard to know where you are. And I think that's why a lot of these people still call themselves beginners because the people that they're used to talking to are people like us and we're a really shitty bar. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that it's the, um, I make this analogy because like I'm building an open source product and I'm trying to get more people to get in the open source. And I think there's a 
there is a crossover between creators and maintainers. Uh, Cause like the maintainers that are really successful and the ones that get a lot of like, well, really the, like the Sanjay Sohras, like the, the folks who get a lot of attention, like they tend to be the sort of like the LeBron James of, of code. If, if, if you will, I don't know if he would attach that to himself, but what I'm getting at is like an open source, I can go spar <laughs> or I can go contribute right next to those folks. So in T3 app, like I, I'm going to be poking around there and seeing what code's been switched because like I'm, I'm going to basically see if I can snipe folks to come work with me. But also that's why we find the talent is on the, sorry, I, I don't know if you play basketball, but I keep going to basketball references, but like you find the talent on the court. So like go play pickup games down the street. Like you skateboard at Embarcadero, you find talent by just going down to Embarcadero and like saying, Hey, I also skate or how'd you do that? And ask the questions. And that's how you get better. And that your discord is the Embarcadero of, of it, the internet. It really is. And it's crazy to see like, uh, everybody from like Matt Pollock, the TypeScript wizard to Ryan from the solid community to Jack Harrington, the tech YouTuber just joined my discord today and hung out in the sub channel for a while. And nice. I think we're going to have him on the show soon. He's like, it's, so cool that like the space I have built because it is more senior, but it is still very accessible. It, it's become that like somebody who might not know much about skateboarding, but is kind of getting into it. Sure. They can join and just sit by the side and watch people skate. But the people who show up for the first time, maybe they like me, I moved here from Massachusetts and I had my friend crew group that would do like weird skate stuff. And then college happened and we all broke up and didn't really have people to skate with. But when I moved here, I could just take my board, go there, do tricks around other people who are doing tricks and immediately kind of fit in. And that, that is what we built is the ability both to see how that works from the outside, but also to dive into it yourself as a content creator or uh, builder and maintainer yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And like the, and the, the, the analogy for tricks is like literally just like go build a T3 app and like come back to the community and be like, Hey, this is what I built. This is like how I got unstuck and trying to build something for the longest time. Cause all the decisions are made. Just go like try stuff and like participate. And I think the other thing around, uh, open source that I've noticed is like the longer you sort of just hang out in the community, eventually some issue will fall in your lap that you just cannot ignore. And you're like, you can contribute to yep. cause you've just hung around so long. That that is the best, like, I, I keep getting questions like, how do you get into open source? I actually went on a long rant about this in the stream. I need to get that edited out soon. Hopefully it'll be up before this comes out. So YouTube search for Theo engineers suck at goals and hopefully a video will come up because that, that is what it will be titled. Engineers suck at setting goals really badly. And one of those goals is I want to contribute to open source. Yeah. It's like, I want to write a book. That's not a goal. <laughs> That's a thing you, you you theoretically see yourself being. That that's like an identity. It's I want to be an open source contributor. I want to be an author. You gotta have a thing you want to write. You gotta have a thing you want to fix or contribute or do. So if the best way to become an open source contributor is to use a bunch of open source shit and a lot of different open source shit. Because then you're gonna run into problems with it. You're gonna go to the repo to figure out how to fix it, see the line of code that's wrong, fix it in yourself or your own self with a patch package or just modifying things. Find the maintainer, hit them up on Twitter, hit them up on just make the issue, ask if you can contribute the code. Like contribution happens when you find problems that you can solve. The hard part isn't finding like a predefined problem. Like if any predefined problem is easy enough to solve, it probably has been. Finding the problems yourself is the best way to become an open source contributor by far. Yeah. That is, that's a clip right there. We need to <laughs> put that on TikTok or wherever oh, yeah. the kids are right now. <laughs> Theo, thank you so much for uh, coming through. And uh, I, I honestly have no idea in San Francisco where you live, but taking the Uber over, hopefully it wasn't too far. It was not too far at all. Only like a 10, 15 minute drive. Okay, not too, not too bad. Seven square miles, people. That's how big the city is. It's a very small city with a lot of people in it. Yeah, and it's funny because I've not met Ryan yet. I've not, there's so many people I haven't, like you mentioned Jake. I've not met Jake yet. So I'm like so excited that like pandemic, like we can now meet people in person now. So I'm looking forward to Jake hit me up. Uh, I, I don't think I've a DMG yet, but yeah, we, we're going to be in touch. For I sure. am sure he will be down. Yeah. Folks, stay saucy. Yeah.